Okay. So this is the program of my talk. Uh, uh, depending on the time, I may or may not be able to tell you about the second. Okay, uh, depending on the time, I may or may not be able to tell you about the Sekeresh solution, but we'll see. Uh, okay, so what's the motivation? A great body of literature exists uh, on uh, singularities in general relativity. Here you have two. Uh, review articles that were once uh, very popular, but explicit examples in exact solutions of Einstein's equations are not so many. And the only widely known cosmological singularity is that in the Robertson-Walker models. And this singularity is very simple, namely in commoving coordinates, all matter particles emerge from the Big Bang simultaneously and, in fact, the only observable, directly observable implication of this singularity is that in the past the mass density in the universe must have been very much higher than now. I, I will show examples of uh, singularities in models less symmetric than Robertson-Walker, uh, singularities that possibly have observable consequences. So. The Robertson-Walker models are derived, are derived from Einstein's equations by assuming uh, spherical symmetry and spatial homogeneity. Now, the simplest generalizations are obtained by dropping one or the other of uh, these assumptions. And dropping the assumption of spherical symmetry, you obtain the spatially homogeneous Bianchi type models. But this class is already well investigated and still being investigated. It remains in good hands. You heard, you heard quite a lot about it in uh, this conference. So I will not, uh, I don't feel the need to discuss it any further. And I will discuss the second, the dual generalization that uh, results when the assumption of homogeneity is dropped and that of spherical symmetry is retained. Uh, well, I, I see this as the first step for further generalization, so I, I don't mean that this is the ultimate cosmological model to deal with. So the most general spherically uh, symmetric metric is the one written here. It follows from the Killing equations that this is the most general form. Now, assuming a perfect fluid source in Einstein's equations, the coordinates of this metric can be made commoving without any loss of generality. So we will assume that the velocity field of matter has only the time component. And we will further assume that the, the, this perfect fluid is in fact dust. Uh, so then it follows immediately from the geodesic equations that C depends only on, on the time coordinate. And then a simple further uh, transformation results in C being zero. So the, the metric that is finally obtained is written here. And with uh, these assumptions about the metric, well, this is the complete set of Einstein's equations with dust source. Of course, I don't expect you to memorize them, but I will show you how they lead to an interesting solution. Namely, well, if you substitute this metric into the Einstein's equations, one of them is, has this form, and, well, this component must be zero. So one solution of uh, this equation is that the derivative of the capital R by the coordinate R is zero. Uh, this leads to a model first found by uh, well, actually, it was that in 1938, but he, <laughs> he obtained it and immediately said it has no meaning, so it should be ignored. Now, Ruban found it again in 1968. It's a generalization of uh, the Kantowski-Zax class, and it has uh, 
very interesting physical properties, but uh, so far it has not been related to any observed object, so I will not speak about it, but well, please remember it exists. Now, when this derivative is non zero, then the solution of this equation has this form where E is an arbitrary function. This is just a peculiar way of writing uh, an integration constant, but it's, it's useful for further considerations. Okay, and then if we further assume that R uh, is uh, the derivative of capital R by time is non zero, the, the case when it's zero leads, leads to the static Einstein model. If we assume that it's non-zero, then the remaining Einstein equations are equivalent to the following two. Yeah, this is uh, one of these equations. M is a, another integration constant, an arbitrary function of the R coordinate. And the other equation defines the mass density. And this is the final metric. Okay, and as you can see, the mass density becomes zero on uh, infinite on two sets. One of them is the set where r is equal to zero while uh, the derivative of m is non-zero. The other set is when the derivative of capital R by the coordinate r is zero while the, the m is not uh, uh, the derivative of m is non-zero. So this first set is the Big Bang. The second set is the shell crossing singularity. Okay, you can see that when uh, this, uh, oh, I don't have the formula for A here. Okay, when uh, this derivative is zero, then the distance between two uh, shells that have different R coordinates, uh, the distance between them becomes zero, so, which means they coincide. Uh, Okay, the Big Bang is inevitable when lambda is equal to zero. Now, shell crossings can be avoided when these three arbitrary functions, uh, okay, I didn't tell you yet what T, V of R is. Uh, you will see in a moment. When they obey uh, very simple differential uh, inequalities. And in most applications of this metric, one prefers to have no shell crossings, but I will return to them later. This solution was first found and interpreted by Lemaitre in 1933, then investigated in some more detail by Tolman in 1934 and by Bondi in 1947. And uh, I will call it uh, the Lemaitre-Tolman model. And, okay, when lambda is equal to zero, the solutions of this equation can be found explicitly and they have the same algebraic form as the Friedman solutions. For example, okay, the explicit form depends on the sign of the function E, and when E is positive, okay, this is the parametric form of uh, the solution uh, of, of the evolution equation. And this PV that I already mentioned is a third arbitrary function that arises as, as an integration constant. So the, mo the moment when T is equal to TB is the Big Bang. And as you can see, in general, it occurs at different times for different values of radial coordinates. And so this means that in the natural cosmological synchronization, the particles of the cosmic medium will have different ages at any given uh, value of time coordinate. Now, the Friedman models are a limiting case of this solution, namely they, re they result from this equation when uh, the arbitrary functions L and E have these particular forms and TB must be constant. So you can imagine uh, the expansion in the Friedman models in, in the following way. The, ve the velocity of expansion of each mass shell is proportional to its radius at any fixed time and the initial uh, the Big Bang is simultaneous in the commoving coordinates. Now, in lemaitre tolman models, the velocity of expansion uh, of each shell is uh, just another element of initial data. It's independent of its radius. And, okay, the velocity distribution is an arbitrary function of the radial coordinate, and the Big Bang is not simultaneous. 
<coughs> a shell crossing occurs when a mass shell of smaller radius expands too fast relative to, the lar to a larger shell. So after some time, the smaller shell will catch up with the larger one and they will stick together, creating a surface of infinite uh, mass density. Uh, now, in this equation, if you look at this equation, you will see that the function E plays the role of energy of the dust particle per unit mass. And at the same time, the function E measures the curvature of three space of constant time, called, let's call it S3, the scalar components of this curvature in an orthonormal tetrad are these. So you, you can see that the, uh, this curvature of uh, space-like section becomes zero when E is equal to zero and is constant when E has this, uh, has this form. Now, and, uh, now let me tell you about uh, two selected applications of the Lemaitre-Tolman model uh, to cosmology. So one application is that uh, you can use this model to explain away the accelerated expansion of the universe. That means you can deal with the spurious acceleration without acceleration. So let me first tell you a few words about the uh, hypothetical uh, accelerated expansion of the universe. It arose from the observations of type 1a supernovae, namely the spatial distribution of these supernovae, which was inferred uh, from comparing their observed luminosities with the calculate ab calculated absolute luminosities, was inconsistent with the lambda equal to zero Friedman models that uh, were considered standard before those observations. Now, using other Friedman models, the best fit to observations was achieved when the spatial curvature index was zero, 32% uh, of the energy density came from matter, either visible or dark, and 68% uh, of the energy density came uh, from a cosmological constant-like entity that was called dark energy just to account for the lack of balance. Now, from this description, you can see that the accelerated expansion is not a directly observed phenomenon. It's a model-dependent element of interpretation of observations. And this uh, uh, conclusion <coughs> follows from the assumption that the model must be in the Friedman class. Now, the example that I will present in a moment showed uh, how this spurious accelerated expansion is reproduced uh, in a lemaitre tolman model using only this one function. And, well, this is the simplest method, but not the only one existing. Well, I must say, uh, well, the first this explanation goes back to 2002. And was it you? Yeah. Okay, so we have one of the authors here in this room. Uh, then I... <laughs> Okay, the idea comes from them and the illustrations were, uh, is what comes from me. Okay, so uh, this is the example. <coughs> Sorry. So, uh, let's assume that the observer uh, sits in a Lemaitre-Tolman model in the center of symmetry and let's assume for simplicity that the other function in, of the Lemaitre-Tolman model has the same form as in the Friedman limit. And then let's define the bank time function via this formula. This is the, the same relation that holds in the now standard lambda cold dark matter model. dA is the angular diameter distance to an object that has redshift z. And the trick is this. We take H0, this is the Hubble constant, omega m and omega lambda. We take these three parameters from observations, but here on the left-hand side, instead of substituting uh, the, the function, the angular diameter distance functions from a, a Friedman model, we take it from the Lemaitre-Tolman model. Okay? And uh, then, Tb is hidden inside this R, 
uh, this equation uh, can be then solved numerically for TD as the R of Z relation is given by this equation which was derived already by Bondi in 1947. This is the relation between Z, Z and the radial coordinate along a null geodesic, a radial null geodesic. Okay, and this is the graph showing the solution. So this black, thin black line is the past light cone of the observer sitting here, uh, uh, calculated in the Friedman model. This is the Friedman Big Bang. This is the present time. Okay, and the corresponding uh, TD of R function in the lemaitre tolman model is given by this curve. And this is the lemaitre tolman uh, past light cone. And this x is the instant when the world line of the observed particle intersects the observer's past light cone. No, suddenly it doesn't switch. Okay. So you can see that in the lemaitre tolman model, the Big Bang occurs progressively later than in the corresponding Friedman model when the position of the, of the observer is approached. <laughs> that means the age of the particles at the point X, uh, the difference between this age calculated in the Friedman model and in the lemaitre tolman model, it uh, increases as the position of the observer is approached. That means the closer to the observer this particle, this world line is, the younger uh, it is at the moment when it crosses the past light cone. So uh, this means the expansion velocity at x is greater in the lemaitre tolman model than it would be in a Friedman model with lambda equal to zero and k equal to zero and the difference is increasing toward the observer. So instead of increasing with time, the expansion velocity decreases with distance from the observer, even when uh, the cosmological constant is zero. That means that if the observer had, had used lmx tolman model to interpret the observations instead of a Friedman model, the accelerated expansion wouldn't be implied by their observations and there would be no need for dark energy. Now, the other example of application of the lemaitre tolman model is a possible modeling of the gamma ray bursts. Uh, this is something that is now routinely observed. So, in the Robertson-Walker models, a light ray emitted at the Big Bang, no matter where and no matter in which direction, always reaches every observer with infinite redshift. Now, in a lemaitre tolman model with non-constant TB, some of the light rays namely those that are emitted radially from the Big Bang at a point uh, where the Big Bang function is non-constant, they reach every observer with infinite blue shift. Uh, uh, well, blue shift means that the observed frequency is higher than the emitted frequency, and the infinite blue shift means that uh, the observed light would have zero wavelength. But of course, we don't directly observe uh, the Big Bang. It's always uh, hidden before the last scattering uh, hypersurface. So what we can observe is large blue shift, but finite. So we could, what we could possibly observe. So that means rays emitted close to the Big Bang can display strong but finite blue shift to present observers. Now, the blue shift is accumulated, you will see this in, in figures in a moment, blue shift is accumulated in a short time after the Big Bang. Now, the <coughs> later acquired redshift uh, can overcompensate it. Now, whether this happens or not, 
depends on the details of the profile of the Big Bang function. Now, the rays of the cosmic microwave background were emitted approximately 380,000 years after the Big Bang. And with a suitable uh, Big Bang profile, uh, some of those rays emitted at the same time, together with the microwave background, will be blue shifted uh, rather than red shifted. And, uh, well, some of those rays will survive, uh, along some of those rays, a blue shift will survive the journey to the present observer, and Z will be sufficiently near to minus one to account to account for the observed energies of the of the gamma ray bursts. So this is a model. Well, it was just guessed, so I don't claim it's uh, it's uh, the only possible model. It's just an example. This is a model of a single source of a gamma ray burst. So. Uh, this is the profile of the uh, hump that we superpose on the flat Big Bang uh, surface. And this hump consists of two curved arcs connected by a straight light segment. The upper left arc, this one here, is a segment of a fourth degree curve that has an equation similar to, to ellipse. And the lower right uh, arc is, a is a seg actually a segment of an ellipse. The straight segment passes through the point where the full arcs would uh, meet and it's there to avoid uh, infinite uh, derivative of the Big Bang function by the radial coordinate because this would cause some uh, difficulty. Uh, so this profile has five uh, parameters. The two axes of the, of the ellipse, A0 and A1, do uh, semi axes, the two semi axes of the fourth degree curve, B1 and B0, and the fifth parameter is X0 that determines the slope of the straight light segment. Now, here, uh, two such humps are drawn in proportion to the age of the universe and to the radius of the past light cone of the central observer. So, the higher hump models a source of the gamma ray burst of the highest observed energy, and the lower one models a source of the lowest observed energy. Now, the lower one has the height uh, of about uh, one thousandth of the age of the universe. This is the, the height in years, and it, it encompasses the mass of about three million masses of our galaxy. Now, this is the view of the hump and on the ray propagating near to it. And when we follow the ray back in time, uh, starting at the position of the observer, redshift as a function of the radial coordinate initially increases toward the past and has a maximum at the first intersection of the hypersurface that is called uh, extremum redshift hypersurface. Yeah? So th this is the ray. Okay, the Big Bang is the lower of the two curves, the ray is the higher of the two curves, and when the ray first intersects this hypersurface, redshift achieves... I lost the other microphone, sorry. Redshift uh, achieves a maximum and uh, then begin, begins to decrease and well, then it may intersect this hypersurface again, acquiring redshift, but here in this model it never intersects this hypersurface again, because it will first intersect the last scattering hypersurface. Now, the technical problem is to arrange the parameters of this hump uh, so that the blue shift prevails over the redshift that is generated after the latest crossing of this hypersurface. Okay, this redshift is of the order of 1000, and uh, so uh, this, uh, so that the blue shift acquired initially moves the observed redshift into the range appropriate uh, for the gamma ray bursts. Okay, 
and uh, when local blue shifts are present, redshift fails to be a distance indicator, and that this is shown here. So, uh, so uh, this right uh, uh, graph shows z as a function of r, uh, seen by the observer. The observer is situated as this at this value of r. In, in the left graph, it would be far to the left beyond the, the, the figure, and this ref shift profile is calculated along the yellow ray from the left graph. Okay, so point one is where the ray intersects the last scattering hypersurface, and point three is where it hits uh, the Big Bang. So the ref shift increases to the past, achieves a maximum at the intersection of the, with the extremum redshift hypersurface, then goes down, achieves a minimum at the second intersection with the extremum redshift hypersurface, and then goes up again uh, to, well, it should become infinite at, at uh, the intersection of, with the Big Bang, but, uh, well, the numerics can't handle this. Okay, uh, the redshift at this point is 0 0.598 and by the standard formula the source would shine about 6 billion years ago. Now in this model uh, the source sends this flash a few times, uh, uh, a few times, uh, okay the time uh, to that uh, moment was a few times longer. So uh, now you, you can see this curve has a small dent here, magnified here. It appears when the ray, okay, you should imagine the whole profile by rotating the left figure around the symmetry center. So the ray actually intersects the same hypersurface for the first time on the other side of the axis, but at a much higher point. And that's why this intersection is not so doesn't leave such a pronounced trace in the redshift profile. Now, uh, these are the trajectories of non-radial rays. Again, they, they are calculated backward in time from the position of the observer, who is far to the left of this graph. And you can see they are the non-radial rays are very strongly deflected in the vicinity of this hem, and along these non-radial rays, the redshift also is non-monotonic. So as an, as an example, in the right graph you can see redshift as a function of this coordinate x here, calculated for the ray number 3, it's this yellow one here. Okay, so you can see it's very, very non-monotonic. And the present observer would see all those non-radial rays within a cone that has the opening angles, angle of 2 degrees around the central ray, and this angle may be made still smaller, smaller when the model is improved. And uh, the presence of those uh, uh, non-radial rays with such funny redshift profiles make this model uh, falsifiable against observations. And a model of the whole universe would consist of several such lemmet coleman humps matched into the same pregnant background. And models of this type account for the observed frequency range of the gamma ray bursts, uh, their hypothetical collimation into narrow jets, and the large distances to their sources. Okay, they account for these three properties properly. Now, for the three other properties marked with red dots, they account only qualitatively. That means the effect is there, but the numbers don't agree with observations and the model needs improvement. So they account for the limited duration of the gamma ray bursts. The observed durations are up to 30 hours. The, for the afterglows, uh, again, the observed durations are up to several hundred days, but these models predict much longer. And, well, perhaps they can account for the multitude of, of the observed uh, gamma ray bursts. They are observed a few times each day. The model says, uh, this model that I showed to you, it says that there are up to 
10,300 potential sources in the, in the whole sky at present. Now, whether this is enough or, or too few, I can't tell you at this moment. Okay, and now I'm coming back to, to the uh, shell crossing. Okay, uh, and the question I want to ask is how would a shell crossing in a lemmer tolman model, if it were present, how would it be seen by an observer? So, light rays emitted at the Big Bang in this model are seen by later observers either as infinitely red-shifted or infinitely blue-shifted. Now, a shell crossing is also a singularity. So, would it have any of these two properties? And this answer was found as a byproduct of the investigation of another lemmer tolman model. And in this model, well, a shell crossing would come into view of the central observer at a completely unrealistic time, namely at about 1,000 times the present age of the universe. So this, uh, this is a, an exercise in geometry. It's not cosmologically realistic, but who knows, maybe someone in the future will invent a Lemaitre-Tolman model with a shell crossing to the past of the observer. So this calculation will uh, give an inspiration what to expect. So this is the model. Uh, the present time is at t equal to zero. The, age, the present age of the universe taken from observations is this. This is the position, the profile of the shell crossing singularity. ERH is the profile of the extremum redshift hypercircuit. It has the same meaning as in the previous model. And C1 to C4 are profiles of light cones, uh, radial profiles of light cones at various characteristic epochs. Now, the model uh, extends only to up to uh, the radial coordinate of 105 because, well, this is another model that accounts for uh, the accelerated expansion of the universe. So it was adapted to observations and the observations don't tell us about what, uh, about the things that happened at larger distances. So the, uh, beyond this distance, the model is arbitrary. And that's why I didn't want to consider it. So C1, uh, doesn't uh, uh, intersect the shell crossing profile anywhere. C2 is tangent to, uh, to the shell crossing at the minimum of, of the profile. C3 intersects the shell crossing at two points and C4 doesn't uh, intersect uh, shell crossing uh, at just one point. And the surprise result is that the intersection of array with the shell crossing leaves no trace at all in the profile of the redshift. So this is again the same uh, picture. Well, uh, okay, here you have time scaled in ages of, in, in present ages of the universe. Large T is the present age of the universe. Uh, and along the profiles that pass completely below the extremum redshift hypersurface, like C0, it's not quite clear in the left. Yeah, the redshift is a, mm, a monotonic function of the radial coordinate. Now, on C1 that intersects this hypersurface at two points, Z has a maximum and a minimum. Yeah, this is C1, and this is the magnification of the end segment of C1, uh, beginning at about this point. And along C3 and C4, the redshift has only one maximum, and then is decreasing all, all the way. So you see that at the intersection with the shell crossing, nothing special happens with uh, the redshift. Uh, okay, the, all the ZR, that of our curves, are smooth and have no extrema. So a shell crossing would not be noticeable for the observer via the Z of our profile. And in a neighborhood of a shell crossing, Z of R becomes non-monotonic, as you can see from here, and so fails to be a distance indicator, just like near and non-constant TD. Now, this is my, uh, do I, five minutes. Yeah, okay, so I won't have time to tell you about the second models. So let me, let me now uh, <laughs> finish with these conclusions. 
<laughs> astronomers don't take the Lemaitre Tolma models uh, seriously, either. they don't welcome blue shifts at all. And in several papers, blue shifts were argued to cause a sort of disasters that uh, the authors said disqualify these models. Now, my aim was to show that the Lemaitre Tolma models have interesting geometry and that blue shifts imply interesting bits of optics that are potentially observable. So history of science teaches us that if some well-tested theory predicts a phenomenon, then the prediction should be taken seriously and verified experimentally. Now perhaps this will happen with the results reported here, but taking into account the difficulties that I have with convincing the astronomers to do it, I'm not sure if this will happen during my lifetime. Okay, so that's all I wanted to say. Yeah. Uh, my question is, consider the standard lambda CDM cosmology. There is a lot of estimations of the cosmological parameters from uh, the uh, supernovas burst from the uh, CMP and isotropy, from the baronic acoustic oscillations, uh, from the uh, gravitational lens, and then so on. And all this estimation agrees, and we have a good uh, common uh, restriction of the possible value of cosmological cost. Do you propose to use another model with the violation of the Copernicus principle when we have the center of the universe? And do you consider one uh, estimation of the cosmological parameters of the uh, age of the universe? And what about, for example, uh, primary nuclear synthesis, baryonic acoustic installation, and another? well-known uh, estimation of the source of estimations for cosmological parameters. Well, uh, this model should not be seen as an alternative to, to the standard model. It's a perturbation superimposed on it, and the standard model is a limiting case of this. So all those observations that you mentioned uh, uh, well, okay, this should not be seen as a model of the whole universe, uh, just because it's spherically symmetric. It can be considered a model of, a, of some localized structure, yeah? immersed in, in something larger. But all those observations that you mentioned can be uh, interpreted as limitation, limitations imposed on the arbitrary functions in this model, but in order to do this in a reasonable way, you have to interpret the raw observational results against this model, because those interpretations are model dependent. So the problem is that this uh, whole picture that, that is self-consistent, it was deduced using exclusively the Friedman class models for interpreting the observations. Okay. So the limitations go, that you got from there, oh, okay, then ca they can be taken into account at, at the first step. But in the second step, you should take the, the models of this type for the whole procedure of interpreting the observations. And only then can we deduce something about the limitations imposed on these arbitrary functions. Well, anyway, I repeat, the Friedman models are contained here as a limiting case, and so uh, the observations can tell us how far this model is allowed to be from the Friedman model. Okay. Um, so you, you're certainly right that, that you can use one of these lemaitre tolman mo uh, models to um, uh, describe um, uh, you know, stuff that's usually, well, to, to describe the, the supernova observations without uh, dark energy. And, and, you know, certainly at least for some of these models, um, as you say, it, it approaches, um, you know, Robertson Walker at early times, um, you know, well enough to, to match some of these, these other observations. But there's one um, sort of other difficulty, which is 
that um, in, in the aromatic Holden models, if you, if you try to model it, um, uh, the universe as a whole this way, um, in contrast to Roberts and Walker, there is a relative velocity between galaxy clusters and the cosmic microwave background. Um, and it's a fairly large relative velocity. And um, so observations um, uh, using the, the Sinai Zoldovich effect, um, basically scattering of CMB photons off the hot gas of galaxy clusters, can, can be used to, to rule out um, you know, models of, of the sort. Uh, so I, I don't think we're, we're yet to the point you know, where we can say for sure that, that no model of this type uh, will work, but, but there are, um, you know, from the Sunyayev's Lilovich effect, um, there are some, some pretty tight constraints. It's, it's pretty hard to, to get something that um, you know, fits the supernova data and, and evades the Sunyayev's Lilovich effect. So it's, it's not that, that you know, cosmologists you know, sort of refuse to look at this. I mean, this is not mainstream cosmology, but, but they do look at it. And, and the models are, are, are not in good shape because they're, they're, they're squeezed, you know, pretty tight by, by these two competing um, uh, uh, observations. Okay, let me say it again. This should not be considered a model of the whole universe. And this part uh, here about uh, um, doing away with uh, accelerated expansion is just a warning that uh, when you use a slightly more general model than Robertson Walker, you can explain this without introducing dark energy. Of course, much more general models uh, should be used, uh, probably only numerically, because to, to, uh, there is no hope to have an exact solution that would model the universe in all of its complexity. But uh, this is just a warning that you don't have to introduce uh, dark energy. Uh, and wh what you said uh, about uh, those other effects, people are considering this in such a way that they consider the uh, universe being near to Robertson Walker on large scale, but with many such Lemaitre Tolman or Sekeresh islands uh, inserted into it at various points uh, around, around various world lines, and then they consider what happens with light rays passing through such perturbation. And, uh, okay, let me say one, one more thing which is not perhaps directly related to your question, but all cosmologists, even the very mainstream cosmologists, agree that the Robertson-Walker models are not uh, sufficient to explain everything. You need to consider perturbations. So if you allow uh, that perturbations must be considered, then why not doing it exactly using models like that? Why should we do it always perturbatively, yeah, approximately? So that that uh, okay, that's the that what I'm doing here are just first steps. Yeah? I'm not saying uh, I never wanted to say that this is the ultimate model of the universe. It needs further improvements, but it shows the possibility. Yeah. Okay. I support your general philosophy, but I would suggest one word of change in your history of science paragraph there. Toward the end, you say it has to be verified experimentally, but verified puts a precedent, precedent on that. Why don't you say and studied experimentally? It may, may not be the right. <coughs> Ah, okay, of course. Yeah, you're right. When you say verify, you were if you are predicting you were all answer. Uh, well, okay, perhaps this is not the right word to use here, but of course I meant to, to prove, to be proved or disproved. That's right, so study the experiment. Yeah. Study, okay. I'll take it as a, a suggestion for next performances. Thank you. Next questions? Uh, I'd like to ask the uh, model uh, to explain the gamma ray uh, uh, it Your model seems to be similar to the in, uh, delayed expansion model. Uh, in other words, five fold model, okay, caused by uh, Novik. Yes, 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 yes. yes. 
yes, uh -huh. because see, there's the, yeah very early and uh, uh, well that that's uh, unfortunate, but almost nobody remembers about his work now. But yes, it was one of the very first attempts to apply the lemaitre tolman model to something uh, observed in, in the cosmology. Yes. Do you know uh, David Wiltshire from New Zealand? Yes. And Thomas Bush? Yes. They are your, your friends. In this, uh, they yeah. are working in an analogous way. Yeah. Uh, it is quite different for... Uh, uh, let's say we proceed toward the same mountain peak, but on, on different trails. On different, <laughs> but the same, uh, same uh, aim. Same general philosophy, yes. Uh, yes. Okay. So, you thank you again.